Good evening. Thank you, Thelma Golden, my great friend, for the, your gracious introduction, and more importantly, Thelma, for your visionary leadership at the Studio Museum in Harlem. And what can I say about my friend, Anna DeVere Smith? Thank you, Anna, for that bold, visionary, <laughs> remarkable, and electrifying performance. And thank you to the Americans for the Arts, Bob and Abel and the wonderful board and staff. I'm so grateful for this special, special honor. Before I make my remarks, I'd like to take a moment, a moment to honor a great person who left this earth today. His name was David Rockefeller Sr. And he was an exemplary arts patron and philanthropist. We learned so much about American generosity from David Rockefeller and his family. So please, let's take a moment in his memory. Thank you. It is indeed a privilege to be with you on this occasion, this very special occasion, to deliver the 30th annual lecture in tribute to the incomparable, inimitable Nancy Hanks. Unfortunately, I never met Nancy in life. I was a senior at the University of Texas the year of her death. But it was then that I was exposed to Nancy's remarkable legacy. It was then that I first experienced the Dance Theater of Harlem, when the company stopped in Austin, Texas on a national tour, a tour funded in part by the National Endowment for the Arts. The beauty of their performance astonished me. To see people who looked like me dancing and expressing themselves in a way that was so dynamic, so kinetic, I was deeply moved by that experience. And from that time on, I became a lifelong lover of dance. From DTH to Alvin Ailey to the New York City Ballet, where I'm honored today to be vice chairman of the board. And this performance was just one of many times in my life when an experience in the arts broadened my perspective and expanded my world. When I was growing up in rural Texas, in the era before Nancy, our democracy had yet to make a commitment to public funding of the arts. There was no state arts councils, no broad commitments to funding the arts in rural communities like mine. So I was exposed to the arts as a matter of circumstance, a happy accident. As a boy, I lived with my mother and my sister in a little shotgun house in rural Liberty County, Texas. My grandmother worked as a maid in the home of a wealthy Houston family. And every month, she would bring me old art magazines and programs from the arts events the family attended. I remember vividly feeling transfixed by the magic I saw on those pages, the images of worlds so far away from my own. I remember flipping through these magazines and programs and falling in love deeply and swiftly. Those pages unlocked my capacity to imagine a world beyond my own and imagine my place in that world. Simply put, the arts changed my life. They imbued me with the power to imagine, the power to dream, and the power to know that I could express myself with dignity and beauty and grace. But here's the thing, I was lucky. I was lucky to have the right grandmother, lucky that she worked as a maid in the right house. Lucky 
that house was inhabited by the right wealthy family who subscribed to the right magazines and bought the right art books and who loved the arts. Lucky that they shared their love by giving me their discarded magazines and books and programs. When I think about it now, the chances of my exposure to the arts were so improbable that I should really not even be here with you tonight. I imagine each of you can name a time when the arts changed your life or changed your perspective. A moment when the arts moved you to empathy or to action. A moment when art made it possible for you to be the person you are today. And I encourage you to reflect on those moments this evening and in the days and weeks ahead. Because you see, we are all the lucky ones. Because there are children across this country growing up in circumstances not unlike mine. Children who day after day experience in their lives the most terrible manifestations of inequality. For them, exposure to the arts, to imagination and ambition remains a matter of chance or circumstance. It can't be, not in a democracy like ours. Everyone deserves to experience the arts. No child should need a permission slip to dream in America. Art is not Art is not a privilege. Art is the soul of our civilization. Art, art is the beating heart of our humanity. A miracle, a miracle to which we should all bear witness over and over again in every home from the most humble and most modest to the grandest and most fashionable. And tonight in this place, our national cathedral to the arts. In this moment, these menacing, perilous, challenging times in our nation's history, I would argue that we need the arts and humanities more than ever before. My friend, Judge Albie Sachs, the great South African freedom fighter and one of Nelson Mandela's first appointees to, the, to that country's constitutional court, was asked the question, is it right for the government to fund art when there is so much hunger and homelessness? His answer was, it's not only right, but necessary. Albie's contention was simple. Of course, the poor should be fed and clothed and housed. We all have these essential needs. But all people also yearn for beauty, also long for grace, also have hearts as well as stomachs that need to be fed and filled and nourished. All people inevitably create beauty and grace when they lift their voices in song, move their bodies to music, shape color and form on canvases or in sculpture, or use language to tell stories in ways that delight and surprise. The notion that low-income people, working-class Americans, or people with backgrounds different from our own do not derive meaning from the arts or do not value full and free expression. This notion is equal parts insulting and ignorant. In fact, in fact, the arts and humanities are necessary to address a kind of poverty that goes well beyond money, a hunger that lives not in our bodies, but in our souls. 
a uniquely human hunger, hunger for dignity and transcendence. The arts lift us towards this dignity and open us to this transcendence. Now, this grand monument, the Kennedy Center, is a temple to this very idea. It is one such place where dreams are born and beauty made, where all Americans are welcomed. And tonight, as we gather here, I am reminded of the words of President Kennedy, who said, this country cannot afford to be materially rich and spiritually poor. Today, today we may well be the wealthiest nation on the planet, but I believe there is a spiritual poverty that plagues America. It, it's a poverty of imagination that corrodes our capacity for generosity and empathy. It's a poverty of imagination that diminishes our discourse, curtails curiosity, and makes our interactions petty and small. A poverty of imagination that breeds distrust for institutions and increasingly for information. A poverty of imagination that breeds distrust of other people who do not look or think like us. A poverty of imagination that shrinks our sense of self, our sense of a lofty and inspiring common purpose, luring us, luring us to extremes rather than leading us to the extraordinary. And I believe, I believe this poverty of heart and mind, of spirit and soul, of civic imagination has brought this country to this current moment, this crisis across Across this country, we see inequality of every kind and every category. We see it in the growing income of the very wealthy versus the static income of the rest. We see it in who holds power in our government and who does not. We see it in who our culture respects and who it diminishes and who it renders invisible. We see it in the imbalances of our criminal justice system and in whose lives matter. We see it in the rise of hate crimes and who we choose to vilify. Ultimately, we see it in our unpreparedness to compromise instead of polarize, our unwillingness to empathize instead of ostracize, and our unreadiness to humanize instead of demonize. All of this, all of this reflects a poverty of imagination, a poverty of imagination that has metastasized into a paucity of hope. As I have said on many occasions, the greatest threat to our democracy is not terrorism or a pandemic. The greatest threat to our democracy is hopelessness. And hopelessness is a dangerous consequence of growing inequality. Democracy cannot breathe without hope. Hopelessness breeds discouragement and despair disillusionment with our government and other institutions that bring order and meaning to our lives and desperate actions that threaten our collective self-interest. Hopelessness hardens our hearts and makes it harder to hear difficult truths. When hopeless, we can't see beyond our own struggles or imagine that there might be light at the end of the tunnel. Too many people in this country feel hopeless today. And yet, at a moment when the arts could be the light, at a moment when art's potential could bring us hope, we who support the arts once again 
find ourselves with our backs against the wall. Those who discredit art's value and power surround us, parroting the canards and memes we've heard for decades. They claim the arts are for the elite. They claim government can't afford to fund the arts. They tell us that art has no place in an economy in need of jobs, in a nation that is struggling to make itself great. Let me be abundantly clear. They are wrong. Those who seek the elimination of the endowments and the Corporation for Public Broadcasting see themselves as cutting waste. But we know, as Nancy Hanks herself knew in 1968, that compared to all our national challenges, be they poverty or inequality, civil rights or criminal justice reform, the expense is relatively small. To use Nancy's phrase, the requirements for the arts are minuscule. The resources of the NEA, NEH, and CPB combined amount to less than one-tenth of one percent of the federal budget. We all know the benefits of the arts far outweigh their funding. Federal investment achieves tremendous bang for the buck. And for every measure, for every measure that concerns our opponents, we have numbers to prove the value of our investment, an arts multiplier effect, if you will. Don't take my word for it. Here's what the US Bureau of Economic Analysis has to say. If the issue is jobs, the arts and culture sector employed 4.8 million people in 2014. If the issue is trade, our arts and culture sector produces a trade surplus for this country. And if the issue is the economy, just remember the arts contributed more than $729 billion to our economy in a single year. And yet, even as I recite these numbers. It pains me to have to make this argument. It pains me to reduce the importance of the arts and humanities to their instrumentality, to express their enormity in solely economic terms. Now, I'm not naive. I know numbers matter. I know that for some people, they need to hear these numbers before they cast their vote, or at least to defend their vote. But these numbers are not why we support the arts. They can't be why we support the arts. Because while we know these numbers matter, we also know that conventional metrics will always fall short. To me, numbers will never explain what happens the moment the curtain rises. They don't measure the quickening of our hearts in time with music, the widening of our eyes, the suspension of our disbelief. They don't capture the changes of heart, the new questions sparked, the sense of possibility that is opened. They don't capture the impact on a life trajectory that the arts can have, like the impact they had on that small boy in rural Texas in the 1960s. There is too much emotional value that cannot be measured. Beyond employment, there is enjoyment. A trade surplus does not capture the overflowing surplus of inspiration or express the importance of cultural and aesthetic exchange. And GDP is not, is not a measure of what makes America great.
Of course, these days we also hear another argument that will rear its head with increasing frequency in the coming days, weeks, and months. It's something I often hear as a foundation president. Some say things like, well, of course the arts are important, but why does the government need to support the arts? Or, Darren, there are a lot of rich people in this country. Why can't Ford Foundation and private philanthropy, these new billionaires, take care of this? And then a millennial says to me, doesn't Kickstarter contribute more to the arts than the NEA? <laughs> well, here are the facts. <laughs> For the past 30 years, American charitable giving to the arts has rarely exceeded a meager 5% of giving, which means that the arts already live on a shoestring budget and can't afford yet another pay cut. And as for the suggestion that we replace the endowments with Kickstarter, <laughs> that's like saying we don't need the National Institutes of Health or publicly funded medical research because the internet has given us WebMD.com. <laughs> So, folks, we can't kickstarter our way out of this problem. <laughs> and private philanthropy won't solve the challenge because while private donors support elite and mostly urban institutions, and while crowdfunding favors those projects that can be marketed online, government investment in the arts has a much broader more deep and profound impact. Because it is the people's way of saying we value our collective humanity, our culture, our history, indeed our civilization. It is an essential component of our democracy. It is we the people who make our nation great. It is we, the people, who choose through our government to invest in ourselves and our culture. Government is not some faceless, evil entity. It is us, we the people. We believe, we who believe in supporting the small rural museums and local theater groups and the book festivals that bring people together across this country. So if we see ourselves as great, we must invest in that which makes us great. We must invest in things that the GDP will never be able to measure. Investments that make we the people richer, better, more complete human beings. We must invest in our ambition, in our aspiration, in that American spirit of ingenuity and sense of imagination that has always propelled this great nation forward. This is not the time for a poverty of imagination in our country. Right now, this is the argument we should be making because this is the argument of our times. As we watch the spreading disease of cynicism and widening divides and coarsening discourse, the arts may be the very thing to save us from hopelessness, from selfishness, and from the ugliness it permits and promotes. In this hall, it is too tempting to quote President Kennedy, so please indulge me because it was he who wrote so eloquently. There is a connection hard to explain logically but easy to feel between achievement in public life and progress in the arts. He went on, the age of Pericles was also the age of Phidias. 
the age of Lorenzo de' Medici, also the age of Leonardo da Vinci, and the age of Elizabeth, also the age of Shakespeare. His insights have never been more true. For the age of John F. Kennedy was also the age of Robert Frost. The age of Martin Luther King was also the age of James Baldwin and the age of Gloria Steinem, the age of Judy Chicago. What would the gay rights movement be without Larry Kramer, Keith Haring, or Tony Kushner? And the fight for immigrants without Lin-Manuel Miranda's Hamilton. Or Black Lives Matter without Ta-Nehisi Coates between the world and me. My point is this. Without art, there is no empathy. And without empathy, there is no justice. The arts have the power to lead us forward, to heal us, to bring us together and help us bridge real divides. The arts are the key to building and rebuilding bridges in our society between cities and rural counties, between the poor and the prosperous, between the past, the present, and the possible. And in this way, investment in the arts is an investment in moral imagination, in our capacity for empathy. It's an investment in the kind of greatness that comes with a deeper, richer understanding of one another and ourselves. Yes, friends, there has been a lot of debate during this last year about what makes America great. Some believe it is the size of our economy or the might of our military. Some believe it lives in the power of Congress or the pros of the Constitution, and this may all be true. I believe what makes us great is the size of our hearts. It is our capacity for generosity and the grandness of our imagination. And if this is true, then the connection between American art and American greatness is easy to see and easy to feel. It is easy to nurture and spro spread and grow. So let us here tonight talk about what makes America great. Our greatness manifests in an enduring, storied, honorable vision that welcomes those who come to America seeking refuge from hatred, persecution, and injustice. Our greatness stretches to every state in the Union, to local communities far and wide. Our greatness fills the air every summer at the Magic City Smooth Jazz Festival in beautiful Birmingham, Alabama. It fills the streets with warmth and performances and art installations as part of Freeze in Anchorage, Alaska. Our greatness is seen on the faces of Navajo and Hopi students who fill the Grand Canyon with their original compositions. It helps students in Puerto Rico to dream of college, to build a bridge to the university and the world. Our greatness gives ballet dancers in Des Moines, Iowa, a leg up. And it lifts the voices of poets like Hope Wabuki, whose family fled Ugandan genocide to find safety and opportunity in America. Our greatness connects people from different walks of life. It brings the Harlem Quartet to Mays, Kansas. It helps a professor from Utah State University translate new voices from Vietnam. 
This is what makes America great. It is every one and every program I have just mentioned. And all of this astonishing and ennobling work is made possible because of support from the National Endowment for the Arts and the National Endowment for the Humanities. And in my home state of Texas, greatness is seen on a stage in a barn in the historic town of Round Top, where thousands of Texans converge every spring to bear witness to extraordinary music and poetry. Greatness resides in the papers of George Washington and the movements of Martha Graham. It is the Hudson River School and the Harlem Renaissance. It is the poetry of Walt Whitman and Maya Angelou. Yes, we contain multitudes, and yes, we still rise. Greatness. Greatness is the work performed by Anna DeVere Smith tonight in Notes from the Field, the work of transforming ourselves and inhabiting the lives of others. Greatness is Langston Hughes in his iconic, Let America Be America Again. I am the poor white, fooled and pushed apart. I am the Negro bearing slavery's scars. I am the red man driven from the land. I am the immigrant clutching the hope I seek and finding only the same old stupid plan of dog eat dog, of mighty crush the weak. When we do the work of the arts, when we hold the mirror up to ourselves and our society, we not only experience our shared humanity, we arrive at our shared obligation to humanity, our connection with and obligation to all people who suffer and struggle and seek to be heard. This greatness of our culture and our character is worth fighting for. And nobody, nobody knew American greatness better than Nancy Hanks. A final story. Once there was a recalcitrant congresswoman from Washington State who Nancy Hanks needed to convince to support the NEA. Nancy charmed and pushed and cajoled as she famously did. But the congresswoman said, Nancy, no one is sending me letters. As the story goes, Nancy said, letters? You want letters? <laughs> and soon, there were flyers on the seats of concert halls and theaters across America. The letters to the congresswoman's office started pouring in by the mailbag, by the thousands. But those letters didn't materialize only because of Nancy. These letters were written by people, people who sat in theaters and auditoriums, people who read those flyers, and people who decided to take action. There is a lesson in this story, my friends, because at the end of the day, it will always be the people who love the arts who will spread the love of the arts. It will always be the people who love the humanities who make the strongest case for our shared humanity. And it will be us, all of us, who will be the best advocates for the work that changes lives, for the artistic greatness that makes us greater still. So on this special occasion, on this special evening, let us resolve that each of us will do our very best to be like Nancy Hanks. Let us resolve to make our voices heard, to bridge the seats in the theaters to those seats in Congress, 
and to explain the value on the walls of museums to those in the halls of power. Let us resolve as we leave this Kennedy Center, this great national treasure, to not despair or be despondent by efforts of those who seek to rob us of our public commitment to the arts. Let us channel our energy into a positive narrative about American imagination, American generosity, and American greatness. My friends, the coming days will be difficult and our resolve will be tested. But this battle, a battle for the very soul of America is worth fighting for. And our beloved patron saint, Nancy, is counting on us to win. Thank you for this wonderful, unforgettable honor. <laughs>